Well, greetings, friends, and welcome once again to another program of Revelation Day, The Great Reset. I'm so glad that you're joining us here in Chattanooga. It's a full house here this morning, and we're just so glad for those also that are watching from around the world. Thank you for joining us. We've had thousands of reports of people watching the program, people submitting Bible questions, people making comments, telling us how their lives have been changed by the power of Christ and the gospel through these meetings. So we want to thank you for joining us here, and we're glad that we can join you wherever you are. We've actually had people from literally every continent, minus Antarctica, watching the meetings. We've been hoping the penguins would join in down there in Antarctica. We've been waiting for a report from there. So if anyone is watching from Antarctica, please do respond and let us know. It is thrilling to see how God has been leading over the last several weeks, and we know, we can see from the prophecies, that Jesus is coming soon. Is that true, friends? Absolutely. We see it from the prophecies. We see it in the world around us. We just want to remind our friends online to go and check out the website, revelationtoday.com. You have been watching night by night, and we want to encourage you to invite other friends to join. There's a number of resources there that are helpful to you, the study guides and the PDFs and a number of other things there. So please do continue to share that with others. We've had a number of questions of people asking, how do I share this with my friends and family? That's a great way. Just point them straight to the website so they can start with night number one and watch all the way through. We have one more meeting in this series, and that is Pastor John's testimony. That will be our next meeting, and he will be sharing how God has led in in his life and how he came from a life of secularism into uh, the truth and into the faith of Jesus. So you don't want to miss that as well. Also, there will be some follow-up meetings for those of you who are watching online, and you'll have local friends in your area that'll reach out to you and let you know how you can be a part of that. So we want to encourage you to be a part of those meetings because we want you to continue to study. We don't just want you to go through this series and say, wow, that was great, and then just go back to life as usual. We want you to follow the truth, walk in the light, be led by Jesus into a deeper and deeper relationship with him, and we hope to be a part of that journey, providing resources for you as you journey along. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor John Bradshaw to join me here on the platform. We have a number of Bible questions before we do the baptisms this morning, and so if you would, just join me in welcoming him. Welcome, Pastor John. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you for your questions. Wes spoke about our next presentation. I get to share my testimony with you. You'll be blessed. You'll be encouraged. I hope you'll be challenged a little bit. So whatever you're planning to do next, it'd be a good idea to cancel that plan and plan to be here for our next presentation. You'll be really encouraged. All right. All right. We have a number of questions this morning. The first one is, how should I begin sharing what I have learned at Revelation Day of the Great Reset with others? Gently, graciously, uh, forthrightly. But the, the, the point is, begin sharing. Don't, the light is not given for you to hide. You know, Jesus alluded to that, spoke to that. Easy ways to share Jesus. You've received Bible study materials. Hey, take a look at this. I've been learning this. I like it. Let me know what you think. Uh, unfortunately, many of us, we share Jesus kind of like this. We want to go after somebody's sacred cow and, and sacrifice that or kill that. We want to be a little belligerent or argumentative. We want to find the points of differences. That's not always the best way to share Jesus. Sometimes the best way, often the best way, is to find points of agreement, a place to you build a bridge and not a wall. Then, of course, you could point people to revelationtoday.com, say, watch what I've been watching. Send them a link. Point them to uh, itiswritten.tv. That's easy, too. Uh, or... Uh, sit down and just have a conversation. I'd love to share with you what God has been doing with me in my life. Invite them to attend something with you. But the point is, do share. Be gracious. Be prayerful. God wants you to share Jesus with others. At the same time, be sure you are living your convictions. Nobody wants to hear from you if what you've been learning hasn't helped you. So you want to be exhibit A, as far as lieth within you, of what the grace of God can do in a person number of ways you can go about it, but I'm encouraged by the question, go after it. Share Jesus. Imagine what would happen if everybody decided, I'm going to pray and ask God to give me an opportunity to share Jesus. Imagine, that's all you got to do. Pray about it. Lord, is there someone? Pray about it. I was speaking to somebody, as a matter of fact, 
somebody that you're going to see today, I won't point the individual out, delivering a medical device, it was a life-saving medical device, uh, to, a, to a home, and he said, you know, when I was there, I felt like I needed to pray for that person. Oh, this is serious. May I pray for you? Easiest thing in the world. Oh, yes, would you please? So it's not difficult. You pray for an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. God will give you that opportunity. No question. Amen. <clears throat> Secondly, should current culture ever supersede the Bible's principles? It seems like modern culture is the pervading force of society. Could you read the first part of the question, please? Should current culture ever supersede the Bible's principles? Oh, I heard it. I just want you to emphasize You want it. me to emphasize no, it? I all, did, right, I did. all right, Could, could you, because I'm, I'm going to give you an answer, but, but I don't want anybody to miss this. Could you read that part again, please? One more time. Oh, yeah. Should current culture ever supersede the Bible's principles? No. No. There is always a current culture. In Jesus' day, there was a current culture. In the year 526, I just chose the date at random, there was a current culture. In the, in the 12th century, in the 18th, 19th, back in the olden days, the 20th century, there was a current culture. The culture changed, culture shifts. Every culture is, is set up so that the Bible may be its primary influence. The Bible lends or gives or offers the best to any culture at any time. We understand the sands shift under our feet, but no, we don't get to the place where we say, okay, we will alter our view on the Bible because the culture has changed. I know I'm giving you a short answer. This could be a long argument. I didn't say long discussion because this sort of thing typically devolves into an argument. Don't go there, though. Uh, but no, 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 no. You never say, well, look, we're going to modify our view on the Bible because practices have changed and the culture has changed. Culture is to be informed by the Bible, not vice versa. Now, when you share Jesus, you understand people don't think the same today as they did 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, people's views have changed. So you can't get away with being as blunt as you maybe once could get away with whether that was good or not. We don't know. Sure. So alter your approach, maybe. Alter the way you do your business. But no, we never would modify our stance on the Bible to accommodate the shifting sands of culture. It's deadly. Whole denominations have done it. They have suffered as a result. Don't do it. Not ever, not personally, not corporately. Let the Bible be the guide and let culture do whatever it's going to do. Amen. People often think, oh, well, this is new. This is, this is shiny. But the Bible says there's nothing new under the nothing sun. Nothing new. All right. Next question. I have been reading the two words in the Bible over and over, justification and sanctification. Can you explain the difference between them? Oh, sure. Um, it'll take a, a scholar, uh, you know, a month of Sundays, and I'm going to do this in about 45 seconds. So no problem. Justification, coming to Christ, getting saved, receiving forgiveness and pardon. Justification and pardon are one and the same thing. Sanctification is that ongoing process of growing in the grace of God. You grow and you grow and you grow and you grow and you're becoming more and more and more like Jesus, more and more like God's ideal for you. Yes, it can be said you're sanctified when you're justified. True, sure. But that sanctification experience continues, continues, continues. I heard somebody say sanctification is the work of a lifetime. I agree with that. Justification. You came to Jesus and he declared you, he made you just. You were forgiven and cleansed. Sanctification is what goes on in the wake of that as you grow more and more in the grace of God. You want them both. You don't want to overemphasize one and not the other. You'll find people, even preachers, it's all about justification. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. That's okay. But now that I've come to Jesus, we grow in grace. That's sanctification. You don't want to divorce the two. These are like conjoined twins. And when you approach your faith in Jesus that way, you are standing on healthy, good ground. Very good. Is it okay to break one of God's commandments to save someone's life, such as lying when hiding someone from those trying to do them harm? No. But, you know, you're going to talk about hiding from, hiding Jews from the Nazis, and then you're going to say, was that wrong? Well, no. Um, 
Well, this is an ethical one, isn't it? Is it always right to tell the truth? Sure it is. It's always right to tell the truth. Is it ever right to sin? No, it's not ever right to sin. Tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to fault people for doing what they feel like they've got to do. I'm going to kill everybody. Is your family in the house? Not too many people are going to say, let me step aside, go right on in. You're likely going to say, there's nobody there. That's what you're likely going to say. So I would not fault you. But once you say, you know, in certain situations it's okay to lie, you've just opened Pandora's box. You're on a very, it's not a slippery slope. It's a, it's a greasy pole. <laughs> a sudden descent to the bottom. Be very careful about that. Pray your way through that. There is never a need to lie. Be prayerful. Tell God you want to honor him and that you trust him to honor you. He'll do it. It says in the Bible, them that honor me, I will honor. Put God first because, you know, we're talking about Jews during the Second World War. Sure, but none of us were there. What we're really talking about is how I approach life today, tomorrow, the next day. You want to approach that with integrity. Never, ever hurt anyone. Very good. Some say it's not so important to study prophecy as it is to know Jesus. Is this true? No. All right. You want to say anything else? Oh. Uh, How do you separate one from the other? How do you? Prophecy points to Jesus. Now, if all you're about is days and dates and beasts and horns, okay, that ain't going to do anybody any good anyway. But if you're studying that in the light of the big picture, The Bible says that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You cannot accurately, adequately study the book of Revelation without studying Jesus because they're one of the same thing. And please don't get on to this. Well, I don't worry about doctrine because I'm more interested in Jesus. I don't want to share doctrine. I want to share Jesus. The person who said that doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. No matter if it's your your teacher who said that clearly doesn't have a clue because you can't separate Jesus and doctrine. It's teaching. Jesus came and he was a teacher. He was a a doctrine sharer. But off that, back to the question, uh, prophecy points you to Jesus. And so you don't want to be saying, not prophecy, just Jesus, because what you're asking for is to see one half of the picture or one part of the picture. You want the whole picture. So let God guide you in the Bible, guide you in your study of the Bible, understanding of the Bible. Of course, prophecy is important. The Bible writers even told us how important uh, prophecy is. We have, in, in fact, we saw him, the Bible writers said. We saw him, handled him, saw him with our own eyes. We heard his gracious words. And then they said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy, even more sure than having seen Jesus ourselves. So don't diminish prophecy. Again, you don't have to be nerdy, a, a prophecy buffin, uh, 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 all you think about it. No, that, that's, you don't want to be balanced in that direction. You want to be balanced, balanced. But Jesus, prophecy, history, the poetry of the Bible, the biographies of the Bible, all important because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Read it with a desire to, a, a desire to grow. God wants to grow you in preparation for eternity. All right. Last question. What should we make about President Biden visiting the Pope today? That's a timely question. You should make plenty of that, and not merely because it's President Biden. But for decades now, every president of the United States has gone, I don't want to say cap in hand, but very obediently and timidly to the Vatican City to meet the Pope. What you will find is that President Biden and the Pope talked about, among other things, but this is the the official line, the climate, because as you know, the Pope is such a climate expert. They spoke about migration, migration, and they spoke about COVID. COVID, the climate, and, and migration. Now, I just ask a question that I hope you don't find offensive. What in the world does a church leader have to advise or even say to the leader of the free world about migration policies in the United States? If I were a president, I would say to a pope or a church leader, mind your own business. I won't advise you what you should teach in your church. You don't tell me what we should do with our immigration policy. I think that's fair, but it's a very different world now. 
Now, what we understand as we read the prophecies of the Bible is that the Vatican City would rise in Earth's last days to a place of global prominence. And what we should make of the news is, look at this. Prophecy is being fulfilled before your eyes. Now, you might take umbrage at my, at my position on what popes and church leaders should say to presidents, and you're free to do that. But the point is, the point is, we don't want church leaders forming, shaping, advising, dictating to getting involved in political matters. We've had that before. We have it before. We call it uh, Islamic State nations. And most Christians look at some of those nations and say, oh, wouldn't want to live there. That's a bit much. And we also call it the Dark Ages, where the Vatican City ruled in the world. Nothing happened without the say-so of the popes. I shared with you a story about how there are elephant bones uh, buried uh, in the Vatican. What in the world? Why? Well, that's because King Manuel of Portugal, Manuel I, went to the pope, gave him great gifts, gold. He gave him, I think, leopards horses, an elephant, because he wanted to get the Pope's permission to expand Portugal's shipping lanes in the world. Would you think about that? Going to a church leader, would you let me run my country the way I'd like to? Madness. But that's what it was several hundred years ago. And we find down at the end of time, it says in the Bible that again, that nation, that small nation, the Vatican, would have a huge influence in the world in the end of time. It already does, not as huge as it's going to. So the news tells you that what we're talking about from the Bible is right on. No one should be surprised when the last days play out like they will. It's an ominous sign, an ominous sign. Now it's not new. And I'm not faulting the current president because presidents going back have done this administration after administration. But it's ominous to think that a church leader, such a powerful, there's no church leader as powerful as Francis right now, Pope Francis, has so much influence, you may debate that, but you'd be on the losing side, with the greatest nation on the planet right now. It's an ominous sign. It's the shape of things to come, and it tells you how things are already. Oh, oh, oh.
Well, good morning, everyone. I have a message for you from God. It's a very serious message. Don't look at your watch. Or your phone. We're forgetting all about that right now. It's the Sabbath. Where are you going to go? Got plans? They can wait. We're in the Lord's house. We're going to take our time. You know, some people have said, oh, they had a baptism went a bit long, but the pastor, will go, the pastor will go fast. He'll preach a shorter sermon. Never said that about me. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. And I'll tell you something. There's a clock on the back wall. But I have lights in my eyes, and I genuinely cannot see it. So we're in good shape. I hope you are blessed and encouraged. It is my duty to let you know that if you're visiting here today, there's a lunch that you're invited warmly, warmly encouraged to attend, and we hope you'll be there. If you are not visiting, but you're here and, and you feel moved by the Spirit of God to be there, then no one's going to turn you away. You understand that. But please, if you're visiting, uh, we'd love for you to join with us and celebrate with us with those who are baptized. Uh, aren't baptisms special? Yeah, that was tepid. Aren't baptisms special? Mm, that's how special they are. They might even be a little more special. We have one more presentation after this. It's my testimony. The man God tried to kill, and I hope you will be there. Who is this man God tried to kill? I'll tell you, it's not me. It's in the Bible, and if you don't know who it is, that's okay. We'll discuss it next time we are here, and I sincerely hope that you will be part of that. Right now, as good as it gets, we've got something encouraging let us pray and expect God to speak to us. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we come to you. You have blessed us so much already, we pray. Speak to us now from your word. We expect it, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Please say with me, amen. A 17th century Spanish philosopher once said something I thought was kind of interesting. God denied to men the faculty of flight so that they might lead a quiet and tranquil life. For if they knew how to fly, they would always be in perpetual danger. It seems like he felt as though this was not God's will that human beings would fly. But deep within us, since like forever, people have wanted to get their feet off the ground and soar like birds. It is thought that Leonardo da Vinci built an ornithopter a machine, a flying machine that had flapping wings that was supposed to somehow mimic the flight of a bird. Da Vinci was a brilliant man, painted the Mona Lisa on a piece of poplar, by the way, not on a canvas. He painted or constructed, made the beautiful fresco. It's a fresco, The Last Supper. It's magnificent. And, and evidently, Da Vinci was far more brilliant than that plotting and planning and strategizing how individuals might actually fly. But da Vinci, born in the 15th century, died in the 16th century, never flew. It took until the Wright brothers came along. There they were in Dayton, Ohio. They owned a bicycle repair shop, even manufactured and sold from their Dayton shop their own brand of bicycle. Brilliant fellows. And one day, it was December 17, 1903, out there on, at, at Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hall, North Carolina's Outer Banks, the Wright brothers got off the ground and they were the what in flight? They were the, no, they weren't. They were the second in flight. According to people from my home country of New Zealand, mm -hmm. there was a fellow named Richard Pierce in New Zealand's South Island. He flew, so the story goes. We believe it. You might accuse me of bias. If you did, that would be the right thing to accuse me of. But he wasn't able to email or text, hey, we're off the ground today. And by the time Pierce's news got out, it was too late. The mainstream news media buried the truth like they always do. And Wilbur and Orville Wright are still credited today as being the first to fly, and that's probably okay. Once people got flying, there was no stopping them. Only 24 years later, the first non-stop transatlantic flight took place. The man who flew was who? You tell me. It was Charles Lindbergh. But wait, 
the first non-stop transit. What would a flight across the Atlantic with a stop actually look like? No, no. Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. Five years later, Amelia Earhart. By the way, that flight across the Atlantic, it was a good one. He flew from New York to Paris, took 34 hours. There had to be some logistical issues being in the cockpit of a plane for 34 hours. But Lindbergh conquered them all, as did Earhart a few years later. And it wasn't much longer than that. Chuck Yeager flew faster than the speed of sound. 1947. Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet cosmonaut, circumnavigated the Earth in 1961. And then came John Glenn. Senator John Glenn, he became, who circled the Earth three times in 1962. Then, Neil Armstrong took one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. It was July the 20th. The year was 1960, 1969. You're doing well so far. Now, of course, well, no. No, I can't say now. Then, of course, space shuttles went up and came back with, with dramatic regularity. But even space shuttles are history. Now there's talk of flying to Mars, I don't, I don't know. You know John Glenn, did you know John Glenn went up in a space shuttle? He was not young by the time he did. He was 77, you know since then, older people have gone. William Shatner recently, the fellow from Star Trek, boldly went where plenty of people have gone before. And he spent 10 minutes above ground. How long he spent in space, I was probably about that long. He spent moments being flightless, Okay, fine, but it does go to show you where we are. Rockets go up, they come back. It's, it's, it's commonplace these days. How much further do you think the human family can go when it comes to flight? Well, I'll tell you, we can go a whole lot further than willing ourselves to get to Mars. We can do more, greater, better. Jesus outlined this for us. John chapter 14, and we are starting in verse 1, where the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, Jesus said, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. This is big news. Jesus said, we're going to get way beyond little uh, plane flights and shuttle flights and, and vanity flights. That's what these rich cats are doing. And flying to Mars. We're going to get beyond that because one day we are going to go to heaven. Would you say men out there? One day heaven. Now it's fascinating. We believe that. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that one day people will go to heaven? All right. Have you ever been? Have you ever seen it? Have you met anyone who's been or seen heaven? Have you looked at the heaven webcam just to check in on what's taking place there right now? You've never done that. So there are no pictures, precious few eyewitnesses, never seen a photo, not even the Hubble telescope has taken pictures of heaven. Not even the Hubble telescope. But millions and millions of people believe in heaven. Many people are planning to go. They're planning to go. All we have for the existence of heaven way up there beyond the stars is what's written in ink on paper. The testimony of people who claim to have been inspired by God, some precious few of them claim to have seen visions of heaven. So the evidence we have for heaven is in the Bible. And I would contend today that that's enough. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from, tell me where. So Jesus was convinced that there's a heaven. John the Baptist, he was convinced too. He would speak about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. Jesus used the word heaven uh, many times, 18 times in the Sermon on the Mount alone. So clearly Jesus was very confident that there was a place called heaven, he ought to know. Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus said, my father who is in heaven. Mark 1 and verse 11 says, a voice came from heaven. 
You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Angels reported about a place called heaven. <clears throat> we'll try that again. And no, I don't need water. Thank you. Acts 1. Acts 1 verse 11. Men of Galilee, the angels said, why stand ye here gazing up into, tell me, heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. Jesus went to heaven. He is coming back here from heaven. It's real. 20 of the 27 books in the New Testament reference heaven, and heaven is mentioned in the book of Revelation more than 50 times. If there wasn't a heaven, can you imagine the implications? This earth would be all you have. You better be getting all you can. <clears throat> if there was no heaven, hedonism would make sense. Selfishness would make sense. Altruism would not, not really. If this, if life was just a grab before you are gone, what would that be? It would be a pitiful existence, except we can imagine, we can believe there is a heaven. Oh, now we're talking something beyond this life, something after your three score and seven, or maybe your four score, or perhaps a little more, depending on how much taken you've, uh, how much care you've taken of yourself and how the ball has bounced for you while on this mortal coil. We don't have long, but if there's a heaven, it begins to make sense. It does. Ah, now this thing called creation and earth and salvation and life and death it begins to make some sense. You remember Jesus said, in my father's house, he was serious, I go to prepare a place for you. Remember what he said, let not your heart be troubled. Now let's start to apply this. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus knew that life would contain some difficulties. The people that he was speaking those words to in the actual instance had attached themselves to a man who was an outcast. I don't want to call him an outlaw, but he, but he kind of was. Jesus' followers left their jobs, left their livelihoods to follow Jesus. And so he said to them, as they were meeting constant opposition, he said, let not your heart be troubled. He knew that life would get even more difficult for them than it presently was at that time. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He says the same to you. He says, you're facing difficulties in your life. Let not your heart be troubled. You're being badly affected by the pandemic, may have lost loved ones. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, job loss, economic challenges, difficulties in life this way and that. <clears throat> and Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He's not saying, ignore your difficulties, act like they don't exist. He's not advocating that. That would be crazy. But he's saying, don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. This is assurance Jesus was giving us. Like when he spoke in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20 and said, I am with you. When? How? How often? Always, even to the end of the world. He said in Matthew 11, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He went on to say, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jeremiah wrote, reporting God's words, of course, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And what you may not realize is that those words were spoken to Israel as they were going into 70 years of captivity. So God was saying to a people facing real challenge, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm with you in this. Don't think even for a moment that, that I am not. God says to you today, we're not done. No matter what you're facing, going through, confronted with or by, we are not done. The best is yet to come. Heaven is ahead. One day our sad, sorry little world will pass away and we will go to a place that we can really call our home. Somebody ought to say amen. Does this work? Is it real? Really? Is it real? Or, or, or was Karl Marx right when he said of religion that it was the opium of the people? Marx was saying, in fact, he said that faith in God provides people only with illusory happiness, believed it was all a fantasy, just not real. He believed that faith in God was harmful. 
I would love to be able to tell Karl Marx, no Karl Marx, faith in God is not harmful. Oh no, Karl Marx, heaven is real. Oh no, Karl Marx, I would love to be able to tell him, this is absolutely legitimate, there is a God, he is love, we're getting out of here one day, we are going home. But I cannot tell Karl Marx. I went to visit him one day, I actually did, I lived in London. I went to visit Karl Marx at his final resting place in a cemetery in North London. He has an impressive looking tomb built by friends of Karl Marx. The irony is that Karl Marx believed there was no God. Karl Marx is dead, died at the age of 64. God is still alive, alive and well. It seems that God had the last say, Karl Marx. God was right and you were wrong. Perhaps the socialist revolutionary was right. No, the socialist revolutionary was dead wrong. A friend of mine battling cancer, he has since passed away. He said to me something very interesting. He was in the midst of a real fight for his life. He said to me, he said, John, there are few things in this world that you can count on. I wondered what he was going to say next. He said, one, faith in God. And the second one, Jesus died to save sinners. His own life was slipping through his fingers and he was able to say, it's all right because God is good, God is real, heaven awaits. When I go, I will rest a while. I will sleep the dreamless sleep of death. And then one day the trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will rise. We'll see that brother on that day. Heaven awaited him, still does. He knew that and it provided go forward for his life, even in a time of real, real difficulty. On the day that we enter the abode of the redeemed, we shall not be thinking back on our hardships. We shall not, we will be saying hallelujah. God was right all along. We are where we ought to be and we will be here forever. The fact of the matter is friend, you know, if Marx said religion is the opium of the people, frankly I don't you get these folks who say religion is just a crutch I'm fine with that I mean it's not just a crutch I'll let it be my crutch I won't let religion be my crutch I'll let God be my crutch Jesus be the one who holds me up I'm okay with that I'm okay with saying the reason that I need Jesus is not because I'm so good or great I need Jesus for the same reason you did and that is because we all are broken we are incomplete We are sinners. We have come short of the glory of God. We need help. You read even about Christians who fall, some of these high-profile Christian leaders who get themselves into very unfortunate situations. And uh, and that's bad. It's unfortunate. Uh, We'll not go too far in that direction right now. But one thing we should not do when we see somebody else fall is point the finger and be too terribly judgmental because it's true. There, for the grace of God, go we. Certainly some folks get into scrapes and it's not right but we've all been in scrapes and the size of the scrape we get in get in really only depends on perhaps the opportunities we've had or the extent to which we have taken our eyes off Jesus at crucial moments we are all in need and that's why Jesus died for us he came to seek and to save that which was lost and God tells you today that he can save the weak There is hope for you. Jesus didn't come to the world to save the strong. He came to save the weak, the weak who need him. He didn't come to save the good, for there is none good but one, and that is God. He came to save the faulty, the erring, the weak, the ailing. He came to save the sinful. Paul had a real burden one day. He records this in the New Testament, and he wrote about it praying that his thorn in the flesh would be removed. He says he prayed three times about it, And God said, no, he wouldn't take it away. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And then he said, because my strength, this is God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. So let me inform you. If you are serious about going to heaven, if you would like eternity, if you want to be saved, forget about being strong. All you need to be is weak. If you're weak, then God can save you. What he'll do is take your weakness and connect it with his strength, and that's the truth. You don't have to be good enough, strong enough. You don't need to try harder. 
rely on Christ, his merits, his blood, his righteousness, Jesus living his life in you. If you just be a little more cognizant of your weakness, then you probably wouldn't go blundering into sin as often as you do, not thinking that Christ is your way of escape. You would be aware of your smallness, of his greatness, and you would say to God, save me now. I need you to save me now. Trying to be good enough for heaven is like trying to make water run uphill. It just doesn't work. But here is what God offers you. Philippians chapter 3, Paul really got this. He said, we have no confidence in the flesh. Now, people in Paul's day were advocating that you ought to have confidence in your deeds, in your flesh, in your rights, R-I-T-E-S, in your ceremonies, in your practices, in your belief system. All Jewish rites such as circumcision and feast day keeping and so forth. Paul said, no confidence in the flesh, no trust in the flesh. Anything you can do to contribute to your salvation, anything you can do that you believe will merit some kind of favor or, or, or blessing in the sight of God, anything you bring to this, no. You aren't to have any confidence in the flesh at all like Paul did. Verse four, Philippians chapter three. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. Paul said this, if anyone else thinks he may have more confidence in the flesh, I more so. Oh, if you have anything to brag about, Paul said, I've got more. Now, what was he saying? He was saying this. Circumcised the eighth day, that's the right day, of the stock of Israel, right country, tribe of Benjamin, the right tribe. That's the tribe King Saul, the first king of Israel, came from. And it's likely Paul, who was born Saul, was named after the king in all likelihood. He said, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law. Get this, he said, blameless oh there were some rigid laws back then as well very demanding laws but paul was able to say when it comes to the law i'm blameless but he wasn't bragging instead of playing himself up he did the opposite and he said i don't i don't think that merits me anything but rather quite the opposite verse 7 says but what things were gained to me These I have counted loss for Christ. Why in the world loss? He goes on to say this. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, if you were to read the King James Version, it would say, I count them dumb. Some translations say refuse kind of all means the same thing. Paul says, my righteousness without Christ is just as useful to me in terms of salvation as a pile of manure. So where does he go with this? Well, he makes it beautiful. Look at verse nine. He said, he wants to be found in him, Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Now, this is transformational. This is where faith comes alive and majorly impacts your life. This is the great difference here. Paul says, I don't want my own righteousness. He says, there is righteousness which can help me. Only one kind. It is the righteousness of Christ. As a matter of fact, he says, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I mean, you would be excused of saying, this must be hyperbole. Paul must be exaggerating. But no, you may have God's righteousness if you will exercise faith. How remarkable. The righteousness of God. Imagine being filled with that righteousness, covered by that righteousness. The fact is, it's the only righteousness anywhere that will get you into heaven. Without it, You cannot, will not, must not be saved. But with it, you cannot be lost. The righteousness of God. How do I get that? Well, I'm here to tell you, easy peasy.
No hardship doesn't cost you anything. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. You cannot barter for it. You can't ever deserve it. This is how the plan of salvation works. You come to God through faith in Jesus. When God takes your sin, he gives you his righteousness and you have it by faith, by believing that you have it. When you believe you have it, it's yours. You have salvation. You have God's own presence in your life. It's easy to feel like a failure, easy, largely because you're a failure. That's why it's so easy to believe. You look in the mirror, you go, well, that's the face of a failure. You make some mistake, yeah, that's the action of a failure. Sure, sure, but you don't go there because the Bible speaks about the accuser of the brethren, Satan, who will tell you you're no good, you're lousy, you're this, you're that. Ah, but wait a minute, you're also purchased. Jesus died for you. You don't wanna give up. You don't want to quit. You do not want to back up after a bad day. You look at your own inadequacy. All right, it's proof that you're a work in progress, but you are a child of God. Professional golfer, Bryson DeChambeau. After two rounds, he was 90th. Only the top 65 would make the cut. That means would be permitted to play on day three and day four and be in the hunt for the prize money. He looked at the leaderboard, I'm 90th. Only 65 are gonna go on, I'm done. Drove to the airport, got in a plane, flew back to Texas. But a funny thing happened on the way to Texas. So many golfers recorded bad scores in round two that it ended up DeChambeau was in the top 65. Problem was, he was heading to Texas. So he got to Texas and turned around. 2.45 in the morning, got on a chartered plane, flew to Charlotte, North Carolina, drove to the golf course, Played pretty well. After day four, Bryson DeChambeau was ninth and he earned $229,000. He had quit. He gave up thinking there was no point him even being in the tournament. Hey man, you are likely to do the same thing. Give up believing there's no point me even being in the church. No point me even calling myself a believer. No point me even playing the game. It's not a game. Jesus died for you. That's the reality. He is in heaven now preparing a mansion for you. He may even be engraving your name on the nameplate. He would do that tomorrow. Today is the Sabbath. He would take the day off. He would do that tomorrow. This is not a game. This is the real thing. You are not going to quit because you had a bad round. If every golfer who had a bad round quit golf, there'd be no more golfers. If every Christian quit Christianity who had a bad day, There'd be no more Christians. I want to tell you today, your hope is not in you. Your hope is in Christ and his righteousness. This is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you are a sinner, don't give up. If you are a sinner, but I could be saying you are a sinner, but I'm being more polite. If you are a sinner, hang on. Hang on to Jesus. Keep looking to him. Trust in him. That's what you want to do. You might have had a bad day, but what you're doing is learning to cooperate more and more with Jesus. You are learning to look in his direction more and more. You're in the water sinking. Jesus is saying, don't take your eyes off me. And you'll be able to walk on water. If you feel like you're never going to make it out of here alive, keep looking to Jesus. Why? Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So where does that leave? What's wrong with this? Where does that leave? Everybody's doing it, so why can't I? Hold on, what is Paul talking about? He is talking about having the righteousness of Christ, experiencing the power of his resurrection, Jesus living his life in you so that you might, should you perish first, experience the power of the resurrection. This is what God sees for you. And folks getting around saying, well, what's wrong with? Uh, Why can't I? Uh, My neighbor does. The folks at church do. Why shouldn't I? Oh, come on. That's not a good approach to your faith. You want to say, what is God's will? And then you go to Jesus and say, I am incapable of that, but you can, because as the Bible says, I can do, tell me how many, all things 
through Christ who does what? Strengthens me. That's the message of the Bible. The alternative to you trying and failing is to having somebody occupying the throne of your heart. And that person occupying the throne of your heart is either going to be you or Jesus. The one thing you cannot factor out of salvation is growth. You see your flaws. Okay, you see your flaws. And sometimes people will come to the conclusion that their flaws mean that they're not really Christians. More than likely, that's not the case. It may be that you are growing redwood trees. You've seen them. They're spectacular. They don't get that way overnight. And you are not going to be the finished product overnight either. you got battles to fight. you got to learn to surrender your heart to Jesus. you got to learn to surrender your bad temper and your lust and your alcohol and your anger and, and your gossip. You surrender it to Jesus. This is a growing thing. You grow in the grace of God. No, you don't have a bad day and say, doesn't matter. You have that bad day and say, oh, that matters. But my hope is still in Jesus, and I'm begging Jesus to do his work in my life. This is why Paul, same author, when he wrote to the church at Rome, he said, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he wrote, it's beautiful words, verse 16. Don't you know that to whom you, give me the next word, to whom you, no, no, come on, this is not a spectator sport. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, much better, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Here's what people miss. You want to go to heaven, so you should. You look to yourself, you see your flaws, some people come to the conclusion that will say, I might as well just sin with impunity because I can't change me. And well, there's grace. And so God says, I got grace. No, no, no. That's crazy. But just as damaging as when people say, I got to get myself ready for heaven. I got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. If I just try a little harder, I could be a little better, pray more, fast more. Uh, praying and fasting is good for you. Surely it is. But it ain't through praying and fasting that you're going to go to heaven. It's through faith in Christ. As praying, fasting, reading, giving, whatever it is, leads you to him and allows him to live more of his life in you. Pray and surrender. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. You're ready to blow up? No, no, no. You yield. Somebody backs into your vehicle in the parking lot. You're so upset. Yield. Call on God. Surrender to God. You want to go to heaven. You're not going to take your anger with you. God wants to take that away and give you his spirit, his righteousness here on earth. You give your vocal cords to God as a gift. Here, these are yours. Make them a channel of blessing for everybody. You're tempted to click on a web page. You know it's going to drag you where you don't want to go. You yield. Lord, not my will. Your will. Deliver me from this thing right now. Pray. Do what Peter did when he was sinking. Lord, save me. And Jesus saved him from what would have been an ignominious end. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, There is no temptation taken you that God cannot give you a way out of and deliver you from. You look at your inadequacy, yield, surrender to God. I don't want, well, no, you could even be honest. I do want to do my will, God, but I know you want your will done. I yield to you now, and God puts into your heart heaven's presence, heaven's power, heaven's blessing. He brings his righteousness to you, and you grow, and you fail. What if you fail? Don't give up, because God isn't going to give up. You stumbled and fell. Don't quit. Because God is not a quitter, and he won't quit on you. You've messed up. Thank God God is merciful. You've read that all through the Bible. There's one psalm. It says about 26 times, his mercy endureth forever. God is saying, get the picture. I am a merciful God. You can't go a day without smoking. Great, go a minute. And then say, okay, Lord, let's go another minute. You can't go five minutes without bad thoughts entering your head. Okay. Well, you turn to Jesus. You say, I need you to do this thing in my life. Heaven isn't for good people. Heaven is for holy people. 
And Jesus, according to the Bible, will work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When he comes into your life, he brings his holiness into your life. This is what happens. Jesus talked about the work of salvation being like a seed planted in the ground. It springs up. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear, then the harvest. So you're going to grow. Breathe the atmosphere of heaven. Just don't take time out from God. Keep on growing. Whatever happens, turn back to God. Lean on God. Grab hold of Jesus. I'm telling you, this is not something everybody knows. So many people are working their way to heaven. I just got to try a little harder. And then the intellectually honest come to the rightful conclusion that it doesn't work. And then they quit because it doesn't work. But if you yield to Jesus and say, Jesus, live your life in me. Oh, that works. And it's Christ who works. You believe God gives you his righteousness? That's what he does. Now, talk about heaven. I must point out there are three different heavens. No, that's not funny theology. It's just what you find in the Bible. There's heavens, the heavens or heaven where the birds fly. And then there's the heavens where the stars are, the planets are. And then there's heaven, well, God's house. Uh, Solomon even referred to it in those words, heaven, God's dwelling place. God told Abraham that he would multiply his descendants as the stars of heaven. So that's that second heaven. Jesus said, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in, and that's the other heaven, the third heaven. And, and so that's God's, that's God's house. That's where God and Enoch walked to when they went walking together back in the early chapters of the Old Testament. The heaven we're going to go to, physical place, real place, literal place. And we go when Jesus returns. It says so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, trumpet of God, dead in Christ, rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Imagine the reunions. Children will see parents. Parents will see children who died tragically young. You see your grandparents, the ones you remember, or maybe the ones you never met. Imagine the reunions on that day when Jesus comes back and the dead in Christ are rise and all of the saved from all time head off on that amazing journey to heaven. On this earth, we farewell our loved ones. Death as an intruder was never meant to be that way, but there'll be great reunions one day. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he was quoting the prophet Isaiah, as it is written, eye has not seen, ear heard, hasn't entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And whether or not Isaiah was thinking of heaven precisely when he first wrote those words, we've taken that to mean that heaven is a wonderful, wonderful place and we cannot wait to be there. What's it going to be like? Imagine. Whatever you imagine, it's better than that. It's not just Hawaii without the trash. It's a whole new place. I have to be honest, it's better than New Zealand. It's an amazing place. Streets of gold, sea of glass, the companionship of angels, the tree of life bearing its different fruits every month. What an amazing place heaven is going to be. It's better than your best vacation. It's better than your dream home. It's better than you can imagine. And by the way, I'd be okay if it was no gold but black top. I'd be okay if there's no sea of glass but a swamp. Honestly, if Jesus is there, if that's our eternal abode, I'm going to be okay. If God is there, I'm fine. If you're there, I'm fine. That's all. The presence of God, that's going to be heaven. But thank the Lord, it is going to be better than we can imagine. It's fantastic. John saw some of this. Revelation 4 verse 1, after this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. He said, immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. One sat on the throne. John saw that. He saw God himself. Daniel saw some of that. In Daniel 7, you get a picture of what's taking place in heaven. The ancient of days, white as snow, hair like wool, throne, fiery flame, magnificent multitudes of angels in that place. John wrote in Revelation 11 and verse 19, the temple was opened in heaven. What did he see? He saw the ark of the testament 
he realized the Ten Commandments were in heaven. So if you've ever had a moment and wondered, are the Ten Commandments valid? They're valid enough for God. They are in heaven right now, and God wants to write them on your heart. They are as important as they have ever been. Important. Ten Commandments in heaven, in the Ark of the Covenant. So if Jesus is in heaven, what's he doing? Oh, the news even gets, it just keeps on getting better. We read this in Hebrews chapter 8, starting at the beginning of the chapter. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected. Jesus is your high priest. He's, it's like your lawyer. He's like your lawyer in heaven, and he's on extraordinarily good terms with the judge. He's never lost a case. And he says, come to me, and I will defend you. Come to me because I have taken your punishment. Come to me because I plead the merits of my blood for you. Think about that. Jesus is interceding for you now. I don't know how large the universe is. Scientists keep reconfiguring this thing and saying it's bigger than we thought. I think it's bigger than they think. And yet all of heaven's focus, while God is running the rest of the universe, uh, for sure, is on this earth. Christ is focused on us here, which is amazing. And he's focusing on you. It's very clear the wages of sin is death, but thank God, thank God. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then we look beyond heaven. How do we do that? Look at what Peter wrote, 2 Peter chapter 3. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. God is going to remake this earth. John wrote about it in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. I saw, John says, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. If you read the book of Zechariah, it says that w w the, the holy city will come down. Christ will come down, actually. And the Mount of Olives is going to split wide open and become a plain. And the new Jerusalem is going to sit right there. The earth will be made new. God will relocate the capital city of the universe to this old place. Because it is the scene of heaven's greatest and honestly most expensive triumph. God sees you as having value. Jesus died for you. This whole thing with heaven, imagine it being one person short. Imagine people sitting down at the marriage supper and there's an empty chair, the one that was meant for you. Of course, I say that figuratively now. You're valuable in the eyes of God. Don't worry about the mistakes you've made, the places you've been, the things you've done, the, the sins you've committed. Don't don't worry about that in the context of this should keep me from God or, or perhaps make me feel like I don't have salvation. You do because Jesus died for you. You want to go to heaven? God wants you to go to heaven more than you do. Look at this with me in Revelation chapter 22. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. That will be great. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Imagine that. God says, I'm going to come and live in the midst of you, in your presence, throughout eternity. Oh, now. This ought to help us with our focus, shouldn't it? What an amazing thought. What a great and a loving God. He wants to hang out with you, and I don't mean that to be... Uh, too common. He wants to spend time with you for all eternity. Of course, here on this earth, we, we struggle with tragedy and loss. We're trying to find cures for diseases, and we just cannot. The Bible says in heaven, the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. This will be a perfect place. In fact, I believe that was referring to the new earth. One day, you'll be able to throw away your medications and your reading glasses and your hearing aid and your walker and your crutches and your whatever it is you got. We will not need it there. Everyone will be healthy and perfected, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there'll be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any pain, 
because the former things are passed away. This earth, it's in bad shape because this earth represents Satan's last ditch effort, his last shot. He's doing all he can to rip this world and you out of the hands of God. Thank God. Ultimately, he will not be successful. Yea, verily, he will only be as successful as people allow him to be. But God is with you. He's on your side. One day there'll be no more devil and there'll be no more devil meant. Revelation 22 verse 5 says, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The glory of God and the Son Jesus will illuminate the new earth. Oh, can you imagine this? We will build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. The new earth is going to be so wonderful according to the Bible. Look at what the prophet Isaiah said many years ago. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the kid. That's the young goat, you know. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. Three verses later, he said, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We should pause and rest a while and think about that. An amazing, blessed, incredible picture. You will live in a place where the flowers never fade. And you may have it simply. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, We are saved by grace through faith. That's the grace of God. And you lay hold on that by faith. Can you do that? God forgives you. He says, I've done it. I've done it. Just believe it now. Accept it now. Let me in your life now. That's it. Later today, you're going to be challenged. God will say to you in, in that moment, just let me into your heart now. Just let me into your life now. You're going to come up against something big, maybe something overwhelming. God says, I can get you through. Just let me into your heart now. Can you do that? Let God into your heart. H hang on to him by faith. I shall never forget meeting Michael. I was in London, England. Michael lived right next door. Michael was a philosophy teacher at a university, a major university in London. Michael had a disease that was eventually going to kill him. And I said to Michael, philosophy, Michael, tell me about that. What do you do, you philosophers? He said, well, we wrestle with life's most important questions. I said, oh, what are they? He said, well, questions such as, why are we here? I said, Michael, have you figured that out yet? He said, no, we cannot say with any certainty. I said, Michael, let me tell you with certainty. I know, we know, the Bible says Jesus is really clear. We know. The philosophers may not know, but we know. We are on this earth in preparation for eternity. Jesus is coming back soon. The reason we're on this earth is so we can get ready for heaven. A very intelligent man did not know why he was on the earth. You do, because you have been created for eternity. Oh, my friend, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to wonder. And if you haven't, it's time you did. Heaven awaits. That beautiful, glorious, spectacular place we've never been. We've seen glimpses of it in the Bible, but we want to go because it's our Father's house. You will be there. I'm not asking you to hope, but believe. The Word of God says in Revelation 22 and verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. We are going to go. A few moments ago, I referenced a, a cosmonaut from the Soviet Union. Early 1960s, Yuri Gagarin flew up high in the sky, entered space, and it is said that he said, I went to space and I didn't see God. One day... You are going to travel through space further than our Russian friend, and you will see God, for you will touch down in your father's house. If you've ever been to Egypt, and I have not, but if you've been, you've at least seen the pictures of the pyramids, spectacular things. When they unearthed the tomb of Tutankhamun, they found that in the tomb with them were things such as flowers, chairs, chariots, all kinds of stuff. The belief was they were going to the afterlife and they would need that where they were going. Or friend, where we are going, we will need none of that. 
We are going to be with God in a land that is fairer than day. And then after having been there a thousand years, Christ will bring all of us, the redeemed, back to this earth and will be here on a remade earth throughout eternity's ceaseless ages. I don't want you to feel like you have to miss out or come short. You don't. There is a place for you right now in your Father's heart. Remember, come to me, Jesus said. Whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. In my Father's house are many mansions. You can claim yours now. And know it will be better, more spectacular, more perfect than anything you've seen or imagined while here on this earth. Heaven. Oh, friend, it's as good as it gets. Not a myth. It's real. You can experience heaven now, not in that literal sense, but in the experiential sense. When Jesus enters your heart and, and he's, he's your Lord and Savior. If you want to go, it's just a matter of faith. Jesus has bought you with his shed blood. He has bought your ticket, if I may put it that way. He died on the cross so you might be there ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. No, you don't need to tremble and wonder and, and wish and think and I don't know. No. And I don't even want you think. Don't even entertain the thought. Well, I don't deserve it. I told you a hundred times that you don't deserve it. The Bible is clear. Nobody deserves it. Jesus deserves it. You know, when he was on the cross, he didn't say, I don't deserve it. Even though he didn't. But he took upon the sins of the world. Yours. Mine. Yours. He took upon the sins of the world so that when he died, the demands of God's law would be met. He could then provide you with perfect righteousness. And you could live in this world looking forward to the world to come. It's, it's real, so real. We're all going to go together. The dead in Christ who rise, those of us who are alive and remain, we're going to go together. What a day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You know that people want to live longer. You, you, you know that you want to live forever. I mean, someone 80 years old has a heart attack, rush them to the hospital. They don't pass their three score and 10. 90 years of old, make sure grandma takes her medication. I'm, I'm okay with that. We like to prolong life. We know in our hearts that we were created to live forever. We know that. And the Christ is reminding you of that today. You know, not long ago, we did, we did a television program at It Is Written, and we, we, we had a little book we were giving away, and in that book was the, um, an anti-aging smoothie recipe written by a friend of mine. A smoothie that's anti-aging. And it contained goji berries and blueberries and flaxseed and pomegranate juice. And I'm not going to tell you all the rest because I want you to get a little book. It contained that and a few more things. You wouldn't believe how many people called, I want the anti-aging smoothie. People stopping me in Walmart. Hey, I saw that program. You got an anti-aging smoothie book for me. This goes to show we don't want to get out of here any earlier than we need to. We want to stay. What God wants is that you live throughout eternity. Eternity. That's how long. Yeah, have you contemplated length of life? Eternal life. I want to ask you where your priorities are today. You're busy studying. That's good. You're busy working. Fine. You're doing this or that, all right. You're earning, you're accumulating, you're buying, you're investing. Okay, that's fine. My question wasn't, are you doing those things? That's okay. Where are your priorities? What's, what's first? God so loved the world. And Jesus says that we ought to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. How's that working out for you? Let me ask, is that your experience? A famous playwright of the 20th century, a man named Tennessee Williams. He wrote Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He wrote Streetcar Named Desire. wrote a bunch of stuff. He wrote a little book. In this book, he, he, maybe it was a play. He told the story of a young man named Jacob Brodsky, a shy Russian Jew who wanted nothing more than to immerse himself in the world of books. His dad wanted him to go to college, and so he did. He went to college, but he was only there a few months, and his dad died. He came home to run his dad's bookstore. He was now a happy man. 
He had a, a sweetheart. Her name was Lila. They got married. They lived above the bookstore in, a, in, a, in an apartment up there. Yeah, he immersed himself in books. Lila got restless. She was a creative type, very outgoing, very talented. And an agent offered her a contract singing in a vaudeville show. She took it. Jacob, she said, I got to go. And away she went. He was crushed, crushed, gave her a key. He said, you'll be back. And when you come back, I'll be waiting for you. You are the love of my life. This is the key to the front door of the bookstore. You can just let yourself in. I'll be here waiting. Jacob withdrew. You'd always find him in the back room of his bookstore reading this or reading that. Sure, he would service customers. The bookstore was a business. He had to do that. But he became more insular, more self-focused, more withdrawn. It was all about his world of books. It was 15 years later. There was a rattling in the front door of the bookstore. Somebody turned the key and let herself in. It was Lila. She waited out in the bookstore. Jacob heard the noise. He emerged from his little back room sanctuary and he came out. He said, yes, she was astonished. Now, she'd aged 15 years, but 15 years when you're young, it's not anything. Can I help you? She said, yes, you can. He said, do you want to buy a book? He didn't recognize her. She said, yes, I do. Is there one in particular? She said, there's a book. It's the story of a young couple. They got married. The young wife left to chase her career and to find fortune, but after 15 years, she came back dissatisfied. The couple had lived above a bookstore in an apartment. Jacob was watching on. It's, it's, it's not making any impact. He said their names. She said their names were Jacob and Lila. Are you familiar with the story? He thought, and he said, it sounds like something from Tolstoy. She dropped the key. Didn't even mean to, I don't think. Dropped the key. Left the bookstore. She fled. Jacob went back to his back room. Never recognized her. She came back. Now, admittedly, the, the story is a story. It's a work of fiction. It's not an historical account. Tennessee Williams was a playwright makes the point, it makes a very biblical point in fact. Jesus in the, letter to the letters to the seven churches spoke to a group of people and he said, you've left your first love. Left your first love. And this is why in Revelation chapter three he's knocking on the door, knocking on the door, what are you talking about? Door should be open. People should be out, well, where is this Jesus? But instead he has to, has to knock on the door. Left their first love. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus fronted up, would you recognize him? If he spoke to your heart, would you recognize the sound of his voice? This heaven thing, it's very real. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back soon. Where's your heart? Do something for me. Please stand up. You've been sitting a while. Please stand up. If, as long as you're able, please stand up. I'm not asking you to do anything other than stand up. Could you stand up? We're about to pray. I don't mind if you come forward while we pray. That's okay. We'll talk with you if need be. Give you an opportunity to express what your decision for Jesus is. I mean that privately. If there needs to be some follow-up, a plan for baptism, a plan for a redirection in your life, then God's going to make that happen. He's going to make it happen for you. A couple of pastors here who are ready to welcome you. And between us, we cannot think of a single good reason to wait. You, you certainly cannot. If you've been holding your life back from God, don't. Just don't. Jesus didn't hold back. He went to the cross for you. If you've been wondering, baptism, wonder no longer, rebaptism. God will communicate to you whether that's appropriate or otherwise, but don't wait. Just don't wait. There's some hard burden, something getting between you and God. It's time to allow God to remove that. You can come right now. And know that when you leave this place, you leave in the full assurance that you're a child of God that you brought your heart to Jesus. You, you, you've prayed the prayer in your, in your advance to the front. Lord, just take out of my heart what shouldn't be there and put into my heart what should. And make me everything that I can be in Jesus. Come on, let's pray together now. Let's pray. A Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we approach your throne of grace. We are thankful. You are good. We love you. And we want to love you more. 
Oh, we have faith such as it is. But we pray as did your own. Increase our faith. I would pray for these who've come forward today. And thank you for everyone. Thank you for every decision. I pray that you will remind each one, no matter his or her age, that they indeed truly are children of God. That Jesus died for this young man, this, this woman. Remind them that every day can be lived in faith in Jesus so that we look forward to the day Jesus comes back. We thank you that you are an ever-present help in trouble, that you are a strength, a comfort, a guide, a help. And Lord, even though there, that there might be some who have hesitated today, I'm going to pray that you would, you would not allow them to escape your pursuit, that you, would, that you would pursue them yet. Friend, are you waiting? You can come right now. Just edge to the, to the aisle and walk to the front and say, Lord God, here I am with my heart, with my life. I want to be baptized. I want to be part of this church family. I want to be re-baptized. I want you to take away this, this mountain that seems to be between you and me. Father, we will pray those prayers knowing that you are true and that you will do as we ask. And now, Father God, we pray as we go, go with us. We ask you to bless these, your children who've made decisions and those who are yet to make decisions. We know that soon there will be more baptisms here in this place and in other places where people are viewing remotely. We thank you for that. Guide and keep us, Lord, please. Keep us in your heart. Don't ever let us leave our first love or ever get to the place where we don't recognize your voice or your face. We thank you and love you. We're going to heaven one day. Let that day come soon, we pray, and let us experience heaven on earth through faith in Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, please say, Amen.